coming up on this week's Wakecast. Imagine the day that you can have your equity derivatives debt have a hedge fund short an equity swap. You have to you have to short sell the stock on the other side. You borrow in the stock to cover it, and your treasury have a repo out trying to fund the whole thing. And every single one of those products is talking the same set of language to each other on one piece of data with the same sets of processes for settlement, same sets of processes for uh, life cycle events. So that you're always in sync. You're hedged and you have a um, consistent set of data and processes that connects with each other. Then you, you can put this out there in a, like a palette for traders to look at and go, okay, I want to do this trade and I can take all these pre-validated things and I can create something that's still a stop loan perhaps, but it's got a nuance to it that wasn't there before and it allows innovation to flourish within the confines, within the ring fence uh, of what's been validated by a legal department. At the moment, you know, just trying to change, you know, just to do one new market, for instance, is fraught with all sorts of things, lots of friction applied to it, which, you know, to some degree explains the, the reason that there's a, a higher um, rate of income associated to it. But it takes a lot of time to go through all of that and to explain to people what needs to be done to get the validations for it. Imagine you could just say, OK, I want to I want to do this. And by the end of the day, you've done a new type of trade. It was all it was all pre-authorised. What a great world. The role of what we do as an association is changing because I think over quite quickly, I was going to say over time, but quite quickly, we're now becoming the custodians of digital standards. If you'd said that to me three years ago, I would have said, what are you talking about? Could be weeks, let alone let alone years, you know, and I think that's absolutely crucial because there are there are threats to financial stability as yet to be defined. We don't know what they are. It could be around the involvement of retail investors around swarm trading, okay, for example. When people understand that, then regulators can go, well, we actually want to look at the data in a slightly different way. Let's pull this data set. That's the power of what we've got here. It means you're going to be able to be much more responsive from a regulatory perspective to changing dynamics. But also you can put those new dynamics in almost at zero cost in some ways. And that's really key. Um, so to answer your point, you know, is this is this inevitable right at the beginning? Of course it is, because this is the only way to solve the complexities of the challenges we face today. The timing is right. I mean, you know, but 10 years ago it wasn't right for this conversation. It took us a long time to get the building blocks ready, but now we've got the windows in order to be able to collaboratively plan to implement them correctly. Welcome to Redcast. 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 Where we shine a light on banking digitization. Hi, everybody. I'm PJ DJ Marino, CEO and founder of JWG, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the next edition of Regcast. Welcome back to the 600 listeners that have found us already on your favorite player. Uh, you can always find us on JWG's website. This is where we shine a spotlight on the key pain points of the financial system and really look at what's happening with the regulators, the regulated, and the technical companies and how they're coming to grips with the digitalization challenges of this decade. Um, we ran a fantastic panel with our colleagues at the Trade Association ISLA in March. It was all focused on the post-trade, and what we wanted to do in this episode was shine our spotlight really on what it takes for an industry to digitalize. Um, I thought it was a fantastic opportunity following that panel to rehash some of the questions, but really get the perspectives from the players here about what they're trying to do, what's truly different, and what does it mean for those that are out there looking to digitalize. This isn't a new subject for us, and certainly not for me. Um, I started at uh, McKinsey in 1990, when it was all about business process re-engineering and mutualizing to reduce costs. Um, I set up uh, JWG in 2006, really to focus on how to get the industry together around regulation and how to think about standards as part of the interpretive process. And we wanted to really get at this Redcast to tee up a lot of the great concepts that are happening in other areas and, and look at what's happening with things like the common domain model in general. Um, but here we're not just talking about regulation, hurrah. We're talking about the stuff required to digitize the whole industry. So I'd like to first introduce our speakers and really get them to come uh, onto stage. Uh, maybe just a quick word of, an of introduction, Andrew. Uh, let's start with you. Great. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Andy Dyson. I'm the chief executive of ISLA, which is the International Securities Lending Association. For those of you who are new 
to ISLA. Uh, we're an association that represents the interests of our members who operate in the securities lending markets across Europe, Middle East and Africa. Uh, many, most of our members, if not all, are um, large banks, institutions um, and asset managers. Um, and we do represent the entire securities lending value chain uh, within our membership. Fantastic. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, Adrian, let's go to you. I'm Adrian Dale. I'm the head of regulation and market practice at ISLA. Uh, the market practice aspect of, of uh, my role is looking not just at best practices, but also the digitization of the market. Obviously, that leads into market practices as well. There we go. Thank you, David. Hi, I'm David Schoen. Um, I look after the digital initiatives here at ISLA um, and have done since July. So that includes the CDM um, as well as the closed library work that we're doing, um, arranging papers and general digital advocacy. That's great. Andy, I want to come back to you first. You guys have just put out a paper and it's, it's a really, really fascinating read. I'm going to link it to the, to this web, to the podcast for people who want to find it on the website. It has a quote in it that says, this digital initiative is being driven by the market for the market and should not be ignored. Why is that? What's so fundamental about all this? Okay, um, PJ, that's a great question. And um, once again, many thanks for the opportunity to, to be with you during this session. Um, we, um, as I mentioned before, are uh, an industry association looking at, you know, what's important for our members and what are the things that they're beginning to ask us and talk about and what's driving their, their business development. Um, now, if we were to wind the clock back 10, 15 years, um, you mentioned in your introduction, the idea of the mutualization of issues and commonalities it was a quite a novel concept, but what we're now seeing, and we would have, we would have been in exactly the same where we would have been responding to, you know, legislation and member inquiries almost on a one-to-one point-to-point -to -point -to -point basis. What we're now seeing across a number of business fronts is that some of the things that we have to do as an industry and participants in that industry are so complex and detailed and all-encompassing, they can really only be done if there's a concerted, united effort to embrace them. And the digital agenda is a classic example of that, where through the mutualization of um, the idea and the topic, we are an the association can develop those essentially digital standards and you know for the benefit of all of our member firms and wider stakeholders and what that means is that um, about the middle of last year David mentioned July but a little bit before that we've been doing quite a bit of work to understand you know what is a common domain model why might it be important and also aligned to that you know what does it mean when you think about a clause library for you know a master a, a agreement you may be aware that we own the master agreement that's commonly used across our markets um i guess the result of that analysis was that um there was a in it, there was a, a, a march towards digitalization that was coming across all facets and elements of our, the world we live in, as well as financial services. And we took a view that it was vitally important that as that world began to appear in our world, we had to do one thing. We had to keep control of that agenda for our market and for our members. And what we didn't want is other groups, other areas or other firms imposing those standards on us. I felt it was vitally important that our membership had a voice through the association to help work with us to create those digital standards. So um, you asked the question about, you know, why is it important and why is it, why is it going to happen? Well, the simple fact is it's sort of happening regardless of what any of us say. Okay. The question is, do you want to be part of it or not? And I think we decided we did. We went to our, our board uh, and they gave us some um, significant funding to dive into the digital world in a serious way. David appeared um, working with us with, with a wealth of experience in this area. Um, and we, we embarked on two projects. One was a, a common domain model, which David will talk about in a bit more detail, uh, as well as a clause library project. And what's key about these things is they're beginning to address and create building blocks that will allow the markets to solve problems that have been endemic and with us for many, many years. And what I mean by that is that all of our member firms are, are struggling and dealing with legacy systems, many of which are 20, 30 years old. Um, we're one of the few physically settled markets in the world today, 
what I mean by that is we actually move bunches of collateral and cash all around the financial system every single day. So it's very important that we understand the sensitivities of the operational impact of getting that wrong. Um, we have a process um, today, which frankly is not very efficient. I'm sorry for all the people who, you know, in the middle of that doing their best, but it's not. Um, and there's no particular fault for that. It's just the way it's grown up. But the yeah, world yeah, yeah, of... Let, let's just dig in there for a second. David, sure. can you tell us a bit, what, what are what are these uh, common domain models and clause libraries and how are they going to help with this agenda? Yeah, sure. So um, a common domain model is a... Is a um, common technical representation of not only the transaction and the product, but also the events and the business processes and the operations that surround that. So there's plenty of standards today that are in, not, not least um, the ISO 2002 standards or SFTR that um, define standard fields for describing a product. What they tend not to do is also describe the business processes and operational processes that go around the, the events. Um, and they certainly don't necessarily digitize the legal documentation uh, that go with them that actually should ultimately control what happens in certain events such as defaults, okay? Um, today, you know, in the event of a default, you probably have a number of operational, legal, and um, risk teams running around trying to find all of the various documentation that they've signed that's likely stored as a, as a bitmap somewhere in some cases still. Uh, and to work out which trades they need to do what with, okay? Um, <clears throat> so last year, we um, started a pilot with um, Regnosis as our technical partners, basically taking the ISDA CDM as a seed and extending that. Um, we use in components where possible, that's a, that's a large part of the principles, the design principles of the common domain model is to be able to reuse components uh, where it makes sense, just to reduce uh, redundant pieces of data and duplication of, of functionality, really, because uh, that's how you end up. That's how you end up with different processes to do the same thing. Is if you allow the model to to operate in several different ways to achieve the same outcome. So and we let, and, like, and, and, and David, let, let, let's let's get Adrian involved here because I think he's key yeah. on these market practices. And and I think what you're describing are putting in place new building blocks, but but fundamentally everyone's got to figure out how to get to those and, and market practice drives all of that. Adrian, what's going on right now and from, from your point of view? So market practice is great timing because I just had a, a market practice working group. Um, we've been working on best practices for quite a while, going through a review, uh, part of the regular review, but also a review because of SFTR, the regulation that requires data be, to be related to a regulator which should have had lots of benefits and it's had some. And there's also another regulation coming along CSDR, which has got penalties. If you get it wrong, if you don't uh, match up your instructions with your counterpart, then there's gonna be penalties for it. So that starts up next year. SFTR went live this year. So uh, with penalties about to, about to, to, to be put on our members, uh, we're looking at, okay, well, what are the we're, that we're uh, failing to settle? So in preparation for that, we did a settlement survey and the data came back from that. And I was talking to the group about it just before uh, speaking to you now. Um, to give it context, we did a survey 2018 and we've done a survey that we've just finished now in March. And the conclusion from those two surveys are nothing's changed in about two years. Now, over that two year period, we've gone live with uh, SFTR, which should have, because it uh, has a dual sided reporting in it and people are reconciling their instructions with each other, it should have, it should have improved settlement rates. And it hasn't, which I think is a, uh, we're going to be talking about that for, for years to come, most probably, because that's a very interesting point. It also is an interesting point of, but hang on, you're going to be charged money for, for not settling and you haven't improved in the past two years. So, you know, back to you, the market, we'll know what's going on there. Yeah, so, so let's talk, but let's, let's talk about why, because I think on the panel I ran for you guys, it was very clear, the number's known, right? Three billion pounds a year, what, what we're talking about is an opportunity cost. So there's a lot of money there, it, it, you know, if, if we start doing this in, in, in better ways, I guess, Andy, let's come back to you. I think you're getting on an interesting point about the dynamics here. What has to happen in order for people to realize, oh, okay, there's a piece of that for me, and that's I'm going to I'm going to start making some changes. Um, it's a great question. We all seem to know where the problem is, 
And I think what's going to happen is there's got to be a bit of a change of thinking within some of our member firms to actually say, look, rather than acknowledging, I'm just going to put another sticking plaster over this particular issue, which often revolves around getting more people in to do reconciliations. Let's understand why, why we've got the breaks in the first place and how are we going to go into that chain of events and deal with that through things like standardization market best practice and ultimately digitalization so i think that you know what's got to change here is people have got to almost wake up and recognize that you can't keep putting um sort of stop gaps or sticking plasters over the issue and the reason that's going to change pretty soon is you start going to get fined in the past there's been and if i look at my market and i've been in it a long time the single thing that tends to change behavior is financial penalties or financial implications. So when you don't get fined for failing and you're not getting funding rates are at zero because interest rates are at zero for failing, frankly, nobody cares. As soon as you bring in uh, a, something like fines, um, we, we generally accept that fines do change behavior. People suddenly wake up and think, we better have a look at this. Uh, so I think the CSDR is the catalyst that's going to say to people, we need to take a look at this because we're bleeding money because we don't seem to be able to settle a trade. That's that's it, PJ. It's very straightforward. Our market is not that complex in that in that respect. So, David, you ought to you ought to then be seeing lots of mobilization from the from the vendors and the service providers and then the data providers in in the, in this space. Uh, recognizing and starting to pull on well, on what you're doing. Is that, is that the case? Are you starting to see take up in what you're doing? So, so yeah, I would say that um, I've been pleasantly surprised with the amount of interaction that we've received, um, particularly after the pilot. So we, we held a showcase just before Christmas in which actually it was three of the primary vendors in our, in our industry, um, all working together to execute, then uh, book and then reconcile one set of data using the CDM in what I think is the first true demonstration of um, interoperability between those three vendors um, in all the time that we've been talking about interoperability for SFPR, for instance. And now with the second phase that we're on now, the um, building out the minimum viable product, we actually saw another 10, 15 firms come along and ask to join the group, some of the larger investment firms and a few more vendors. So yes, I think we are seeing that, that uptake and engagement. I, sorry, PJ, can I just let's pick up a couple of points? So Andy mentioned about putting plasters on things. If you take the example of, okay, penalties are coming and I want to reduce my exposure to them, what shall I do? I'll hire some more people. If you hire more people, then you still have the same issues that you have at the moment. And it's a great, great example of putting a plaster on something by throwing resource at it simply isn't going to do it because volumes in these markets is going to keep on going up as spreads go down. And you can't you can't just keep on throwing more and more people at it. If you have a digital approach, then you then there's a way of saving money in there because you can increase the volumes and, and not increase your resourcing. And that's part of the reason that firms are, are becoming more and more interested in, in the common domain model. The the going back a second to your three billion number, there was a great quote, I, think, I can't remember who said it, but was it operational deficit? Was that the was that the term that Pro got used in your plan? Process, process debt. So that there's there's another example of that, you know, throwing more bodies at it. But there's another cost implication that didn't come up in the panel, and it's for regulatory reporting. And there was a great uh, pilot study that was done using CDM as well, but the the derivative one, not not the one that we're working on, that had a number of a forty percent saving in terms of regulatory reporting cost, which I think I, that was it, it was amazing when I saw it. But actually, when you think about how much money's been ploughed into this. Uh, SFTR regulation we've just been working on that wouldn't have been required if you'd had these standards. And sorry, this is the last point. What that's brought up is, is that firms don't have the same uh, uh, view on what the life cycle of a transaction is. And that's exactly what the CDM is supposed to be you know, aiming at. And there are still breaks today on life cycle disagreements, we call them between counterparts. And, and the only way to solve that would be just that they all represent their data in the same way, not just to each other, but also in their internal systems. Yeah, Andrew, I, I, think, I think that's spot on. And I, I guess it highlights a bigger question around timing, right? And what, what, I, what I've seen, I mean, I, I, I was there in 20, uh, 2000, sorry, 2006 when MIFID 1 was rolling out. And everyone was just sort of taking a you know, securities-based reporting regime and looking at how to extend it. And then we went through it again 10 years later 
Um, you know, we, for derivatives, we've been doing this for a, a decade, and it's all been very suboptimal because we've reacted very quickly. That you know, we waited, 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 finally got the specs, and then we just reacted. And, and I think that the difference of timing that I see now is that people are getting ahead of things, right? You're, you're talking about working on something now that's due next year, you know, and that that gives the market a chance to to, to, to come together. I guess what you know, from my point of view, it, you know, the, the 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 challenge comes in that legacy and that process process debt or or technology debt that you've got, and trying to get it to adapt. And I guess that's the big challenge: is how do you get everybody to to realign against these these new artifacts? How, how big of a challenge for CSDR do you think that's actually going to be? For, 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 to me to answer, right? Uh, I think actually it's with the survey, actually, I, I was talking about earlier, actually, is giving us an insight into it. One of the, uh, one of the responses that came back to the survey was the reason that something didn't settle is because the counterpart, the person who's delivering it to them, was insufficient. They don't have the securities. All that's telling you is that somewhere or other upstream, there's been all those problems. There's been a life cycle disagreement. There's some static data that's gone wrong, or whatever it might be. And it also, it's a very important light that security lending is a part in the in the wider ecosystem of financial markets. Assets are passing through the security lending market, and they could have come from anywhere else with different legal agreements, different standards that apply to them. And until you start to link all these things together together to, to form you know that that uh, one chain across all the ecosystems you're not going to solve some of these underlying problems so there are some at the moment that when people look at them they're completely insurmountable they can't there's no way they're going to be able to solve them until the whole market starts moving towards uh, digitization and it seeps into every aspect of everything that everyone does and at some point there'll be something equivalent to the Cambrian explosion where all of a sudden the data will just fit together correctly and things will start to flow, and I, and I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it's as profound enough to you know to to appear on the some of the pink newspapers and those sort of uh, publications because it, I think it'd be profound at that, and we'll see it happening. It's it's like almost like a revolutionary type of um, moment. I, I love that explosion. I, I guess who who lights the match and you know, who who puts it to the touch paper? Is it? Is it the legal guys who really want to adopt your, you know, the, the common contracts and codify, recodify all the, the legal agreements that they have, or is it more the ops and tech crowd that really wants to get the uh, these processes and reporting sorted out? And Andy, what's your view? You have a you have a mixed membership there. Yeah, um, I think it, it's going to be a, a mixture of both. And what I mean by that is that already uh, we talk to lawyers and and legal representatives from member firms who are who are you know, right at the cutting edge of working with us in terms of something like the clause library, they sort of get it and they understand the benefits of standardizing the variations and the clauses. Um, and even there, there's, I think the name of the game here is PJ, is efficiencies. So they're looking for speed and efficiency of negotiation so they, they can use less lawyers, less legal time, which tends to be a premium cost. Similarly, in the, the ops world, um, not only have you got this idea of, you know, um, legacy infrastructure, um, collecting around it more cost as it needs more people to keep it running um whether that be through reconciliations or whatever but you've also got the the, spe the scepter of fines so i think you know people running um post trade areas will be now saying well we've not only got an inefficient model that we're probably underwater with we've actually now got the impact of fines so at, a, at an overall business level people who run overall businesses they've really got to be saying to themselves you know, actually, does this business still make sense from a P&L perspective? Perhaps it might not. And I do fear that some of this could, in theory, and this is an interesting debate, at one side could argue that people will be forced away from the market because it plays into the hands with people with scale. Um, but actually, we, we would actually see it in a completely different way. By standardizing entry points into our market, which is what something like the CDM and the clause library do, it lowers barriers to entry in terms of cost. And therefore, we will attract new entrants. Um, and we've already seen quite a lot of interest from firms who you might regard as sitting on the periphery of our markets, custody providers, et cetera, who get what we're trying to do immediately. Um, so um, I think this is a, a business-wide uh, decision. It's all about efficiencies and cost saving. Because don't forget, the markets that most people are trading in today are 
apart from the odd volatility around things like COVID, are generally benign and it's harder to make money every single day. And therefore, if you can create efficiencies on the on the on the cost side of the business, that's got to be that's got to be where you're, you're focusing. So I think does that answer your question, PJ? Yeah, I, I, I think it does. And it forces us into that standards discussion. I wanted to bring David in on here. So, so David, standards are great to talk about because everyone just nods their head and says yes. But there's actually so many of them. And what we're talking about is actually changing the way standards are done. So a lot, a lot of the way regulators have approached standards is to give us data points. Like yeah. they, they come up with Excel table. They say, this is what we want to see in it. And we give you some rough scenarios. And you guys knock yourselves out and tell us how, it, how it's going to work. What changes with with CDM in your in your mind, and what additional thinking has to be done to to, to make this a, a more viable set of standards? So, so the things that are different for me is, I mean, the, the as you said, right, we've, we've got plenty of standard sets of data points in the working group set. But not just at ISLIP, but also is there and if they're also running their own own programs, developing um, their product bases. A lot of the focus is actually more on Right, what's the operational or business process behind this? And more importantly, what is the act, what should it look like? What should it look like ideally? Um, uh, so it's it's codifying that process behind the business events where I think there's there's the first difference. And the second one is I think this is the first time I've seen this level of collaboration across the global markets communities. So all three associations working together to come up with a, a way that all of our product classes interact in a common language. So imagine that you're um, uh, uh, head of technology for a large broker dealer. Your, your, your team supports multiple businesses, right? We've all got to learn multiple code bases, multiple different databases. It probably, you should probably spend 50% of your budget keeping the lights on, trying to keep systems talking to each other, okay? Imagine the day that you can have your equity derivatives test have a hedge fund short an equity swap. You have to you have to short sell the stock on the other side. You borrow in the stock to cover it, and your treasury have a repo out trying to fund the whole thing. And every single one of those products is talking the same set of language to each other on one piece of data with the same sets of processes for settlement, same sets of processes for um, life cycle events. So that you're always in sync. You're hedged, and you have a. Um, consistent set of data and processes that connects with each other that's and, a th the dream and and pj just to echo in david's point i think you can see from what he's saying is this is so important particularly you know the way we're aligning with the other associations it has to be in the hands of people like us because if a big provider or commercial provider or vendor got hold of this the the, the standards they would almost have a monopoly um, and that will be wrong for all parties concerned so it's vitally important that these standards are developed and maintained through people like us um, and that's partly why the role of what we do as an association is changing because I think over quite quickly, I was going to say over time, but quite quickly, we're now becoming the custodians of digital standards. Mm -hmm. If you'd said that to me three years ago, I would have said, what are you talking about? But, but here we are today actually talking about that because if you think about how transformational what David's talking about could be, we've got to, we've got to keep our arms around it for the benefit of the markets and our members. No, that's a great point. Adrian, I'll let come back to you on that because there's another add-on for regulation, which is you also become custodians of the linkage between those standards and regulatory text. Because ultimately, it, does, it doesn't matter, well, depending where you are, the market practice is important, but ultimately you need to satisfy the law. So what, what is this going to mean for, for, for the market practice groups and how they think about digitizing the interpretation of the law around, you know, for, for the purposes of the market? So in terms of the day-to-day -day practices that we have today uh, and th those obligations that, are, that you know, people are reporting to, there's not, nothing's going to change in those because you can use CDM, you can translate it into the thing the regulator asks for. Um, I'm going to go back to SFTR again, and it's been quoted as one of those things that introduced a great standard to the market. or actually started the process and, and got firms to, to talk together to collaborate and to create standards. but it was done through a regulatory imperative. 
So it's great for regulators to see some data I, I, that I use that that reservedly as well, because it doesn't show the entire market and they, they fully understand that, which is why you have to have iterations of the regulation. Um, but it's at least getting us in, heading in the right direction. If it, so if you've got CDM, you can start having conversations with them about moving from push to pull. So we're pushing uh, regulate, regulatory data to, to them at the moment. And each time they, they think, oh, there's something else I want to see, then you end up with another bespoke regulation, another bespoke data point that perhaps the market doesn't have and, or shouldn't, you know, and shouldn't be creating to do that, 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 that reporting. We can change to, uh, do you know what? I'm not going to push the data to you. It's, it's right here. There's a standard representation of the whole thing. Come and take what you want. And you can see regulators doing that already saying, do you know, actually, um, that's uh, that pilot scheme that I spoke to you about earlier, about 40% saving. Other regulators, and this is one of those things Andy was alluding to earlier, from a firm perspective, but regulators are doing the same. When one regulator says, okay, I've nailed it, this, I've got it now, and I'm, I'm pulling the data I want, and I can change the regulation around, it validates it against the CDM, yes, that's what I wanted to have, press the go button, all done participants or the people who are pushing the data beforehand don't have to do anything so that they've got their cost saving. Another regulator is going to go, well, hang on, how did they do that? I want to have some of that action as well, because then they get transparency they want to have. Also, Adrian, you're right, absolutely spot on. But, but PJ, look at this. How long did it take the market to formulate SFTR? It's about 10 years, right, from when it was conceived to when it was delivered. So we might argue, and I've said it several times, that's now solving a problem that no longer exists. But there you go, hey ho, that's the nature of regulation. But the speed of the speed to market regulation in the future could be weeks, let alone let alone years. You know, and I think that's absolutely crucial because there are there are threats to financial stability as yet to be defined. We don't know what they are. It could be around the involvement of retail investors around swarm trading. Okay, for example, when people understand that then regulators can go, well, we actually want to look at the data in a slightly different way. Let's pull this data set. That's the power of what we've got here. It means you're going to be able to be much more responsive from a regulatory perspective to changing dynamics, but also you can put those new dynamics in almost at zero cost in some ways. And that's really key. Um, so to answer your point, you know, is this, is this inevitable right at the beginning? Of course it is, because this is the only way to solve the complexities of the challenges we face today. Yeah. Uh, that's a fantastic point. We've had a, a couple of these uh, episodes of Raycast. We focused a lot on GameStop and what it means to the infrastructure. And there's a whole whole world of change coming, especially as we move to T plus one and, and, and thinking about the kind of creaky infrastructure we've got today. So I, I think there's a, there's a lot there that, that to, to unpick for people. But I, I think the, the point being that the timing is right. I mean, you know, if it, 10 years ago, it wasn't right. For this conversation it took us a long time to get the building blocks ready but now we've got the windows in order to be able to collaboratively plan to implement them correctly yeah, yeah as we as we go at this again so i think that's, that's great news and, and guys I, it's amazing but we're already at half an hour here so i want to start moving towards a, a summary from you and i wanted to do that in, in the form of a, you know one big question so you think, think about how you, you can take a minute or so to answer the, the question about once we're digital you know, so in, in the future, put yourself out whatever time period you like for the, in your answer, what, what, what business will change the most and what, what's it really going to mean for the infrastructure? And uh, David, I'd like to lead with you, please. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, clearly it's going to be the post-trade world. Um, as soon as you can integrate digital legal documentation along with a standard representation of your transactions, you've got a small contract, right? Um, you know, well, that doesn't have to live on a chain. It can live uh, anywhere you want. The, I mean, you know, the apps on your phone today effectively are all operating through smart contracts. But look at how little operational support you require to run something like Uber, right? So that, I think, is what we're going to see change the most in the next 10 years. Thank you. Great, great, great point. Um, uh, Adrian, let's go to you next. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of them. Actually, we can go on for another half an hour. But the, actually, one of the things I like to I like to think about is innovation. It sort of tags a, a little bit with what David was saying. Uh, the so with when you when you have the standardisation, especially in the legal um, sphere, 
at all of the individual parts of a legal contract have been validated by your legal department and they could go through validating all the different combinations of the variants of, of that legal contract as well then you could you can put this out there in a like a palette for traders to look at and go okay i want to do this trade and i can take all these pre-validated things and i can create something it's still a stop loan perhaps but it's got a nuance to it that wasn't there before and it allows innovation to flourish within the confines within the ring fence uh, of what's been validated by a legal department at the moment they're just trying to change you know just to do one new market for instance is to fraught with all sorts of things lots of friction applied to it which you know to some degree explains the, the reason that there's a, a higher um, rate of income associated to it but it takes a lot of time to go through all of that and to explain to people what needs to be done to get the validations for it imagine you could just say okay i want to i want to do this and by the end of the day you've done a new type of trade it was all it was all pre-authorized what a great world. Sounds fantastic. Andrew, Andy, what do you want? Um, yeah, listen, it, it's a great question. And I would echo um, both what David and Adrian have said. The other thing I think this brings us to is, is a world where we've seen in the past that the decision to either connect or buy a service or trade with a counterparty can be can be driven quite often by how easy it is to connect with them or join up the bits of cable between each other. Um, I think when we get to a point when all you need to say to a vendor or provider is, do you support the CDM? And then it truly becomes plug and play. So that's the first thing. Um, and I'd like to see that world. And I think the speed at which we're going, that isn't as far away as people perhaps would, would think. And some of the legacy incumbents would like to think that's a long way off. I think it's coming pretty quick. The other point I, I'd like to see is that that means I want market participants and vendors to compete on the quality of their products and services, not how well they can connect it up with each other, which has been a factor in the past, which means that the entry point for startups with new ideas and new creativity um, and new products is much lower than it was ever been. So I'd like, so therefore I see a big, deep, vibrant market um, that people can move in and out of. Now, that in itself is great, but it also presents a huge challenge or threat. Because if you make it really easy to enter a market, then somebody might show up in that market who could actually dominate. So, you know, some of the incumbents from elsewhere in the digital space might see the opportunity, particularly from a digitalized perspective and think, that's easy, we understand that market, it's all standardized, let's move into it. We've seen that, we've seen that in other markets, um, which means you've got to be prepared to be confident you can compete on the quality of your goods and services, not put up barriers to entry. So there's, I think there's a, an exciting time ahead for all because of these developments. Does that answer your question? It does. And th thank you all very much for your very clear and concise answers. I, I think what I take away from it is, yes, absolutely, CDM and, and, and all of the tooling and infrastructure around it is critical for regulation, but even more critical for the economy. And, and, and it's that innovation cycle uh, mm -hmm. that, that obviously will help, that, you know, regulators will want to stay uh, abreast of all that, but they can do it in a lot better ways than they're currently doing now. Um, so for me, that's a, a fantastic wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been a, a pleasure working with you over the last couple of weeks. Um, and for those of you who are, are, are listening to this for the first time, please subscribe so you can keep following this conversation. Next episodes, we'll be uh, covering more about what we're doing on the derivative side uh, with a couple of different trade associations there and looking at how we're actually getting the benefits across the whole industry and what we think it really might mean from a market practice standards at some of the uh, biggest firms out there. So without further ado, I thank you and uh, we will see you soon. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You can download the podcast via Spotify, Apple and Google, but also I'd encourage people to come to the JWG website, which as hopefully you will know is jwg-it.eu. Go to the Intelligence Hub and create your bespoke library. This is Redcast, where we shine a light on banking digitization.